Kristen Moore and I oversee marketing for Bricksmore Property Group. Thank you for spending time with us today. Our goal today is to provide you with actionable intel to help you grow your restaurant's business. The format is a panel discussion followed by 15 minutes for Q&A. So please feel free to type in a question at any time. Moderating our discussion today is Angel Cicerone. She is founder and president of retail consultancy firm, Tenant Mentorship, and also author of Growing Small, How to Manage, Market, and Measure Your, Retails, your Way to Retail Success in 90 Days. And now Angel's gonna introduce our panelists. Thank you, Kristen. Hope everybody's having a great day. Uh, really excited to be here today. We've got an amazing panel who are gonna bring you a lot of different perspectives about reopening your restaurant, so I'm gonna start here with Michael Bacon. He is the managing partner of Brewburgers Pub and Grill with two locations in Southwest Florida. Moving over to the right, we have Laureen Sustacek. See, I told you I was gonna stumble on it. Um, <clears throat> who is the um, VP of Lease Administration and Facilities for First Watch Restaurants. For those of you who have been to the Daytime Cafe, it's very popular. They have over 300 locations. And in the bottom left, you're going to see our friend Katarina Kumbaros, who is the owner of Taberna Opa and Tapa Toro, both on iDrive in Orlando. And she's in the car. She had to quickly zoom in, tell everybody why you are in your car doing this, Katarina. Um, so as much precautions as we try to take within the restaurant, you know, there's always those that are around us. So we were informed by one of our vendors that one of their employees um, was diagnosed with COVID-19. So my husband and I quickly went to um, one of the clinics to get tested. And after waiting about six hours, um, right around three o'clock, uh, they called us in to get the test done. So we're... we're I, that's why I'm in the car. <laughs> Very appropriate. How yeah. Okay, we're going to dig right in so we can get a lot of information out. So I'm going to start with you guys. And I wanted the first question I want to ask you on that day in mid March, whatever day that was for you, the 15th, the 17th, the 20 something, where were you with your restaurant and what were the first steps that you took? I want to go back and see what you did in that first couple of weeks of. Um, when all of this ha started happening. Lorraine, let's start with you. Okay, so, um, so we were fortunate um, on Friday the 13th when the president had declared the national emergency, our senior leadership had already put in a task force already to monitor the ongoing situation and understand the effects um, that the, this uh, COVID would have on all of us, on our team members, our customers, our families, our friends. Um, so they were in place to make decisions as the situation was changing. As you know, it was changing rapidly. Um, first, the dining rooms were forced to close. And so we were offering takeout only. Um, after a few weeks, our concept president made a tough decision to close our over 300 corporate restaurants. He felt like we had a really reduced team um, offering the to-go only, and he was concerned that they would get worn out. Uh, he was uh, worried about them being exposed to the public, being exposed to each other. Uh, personal protection equipment was scarce at that time. As you recall, it was prioritized for first responders. Um, so in keeping with our You First culture, he made the very tough decision to close in early April. And then in the next six weeks, um, the top priority after the closures was the protection of our people and staying connected with them. We didn't want six weeks to go by and then we give them a call and say, hey, we reopened, um, you know, come on back. So we stayed connected. Our VPs checked in with them every week. Uh, just to touch base and see how they were doing, just listen. And now when it was time to relaunch, it was just a continuum of that conversation. But you were actually closed your restaurants. Yes, we actually closed the restaurants. No, it's no takeout and delivery even. Nope. So for the past six weeks, we've been completely closed. Okay. So, 
Great. Thanks, Laureen. So, Michael, what happened on that day for you? A little bit of a different tact, I would <laughs> say. Um, I was actually on vacation in Katerina's neighborhood uh, with my family and some friends in Orlando when the news came out, and we were kind of stuck in this house, and I, I canceled my vacation. I said, okay, I need to go back and go to the restaurant. My friends were like, you're crazy. This is not this, – nothing is really happening. Of course, I live in Florida, which is the Wild West, as we know. Um, so immediately I got back to the restaurant, and the first thing I did was uh, – actually reach out to um, some contacts in, in town and try to figure out a way that if we could only do carry out and delivery, I could do all of it uh, or as much of it as I could get. Um, so immediately went to work with some charity groups, um, actually donated a bunch of meals to the hospitals, um, started working with church groups that I had dealt with before. Um, and what started out as a, a goal for me to get my name circulated as the place to go for carry out turned into be a quit the philanthropic, I guess is the, uh, the term I'll use uh, endeavor for me, which in turn worked out to be a marketing coup as well, because we, we certainly kept busy um, with a very minimal staff. Cause that was the other thing that we had done was, okay, if, if I can't do dine in normally only 10% of my business is carry out, how much can I do? And we ended up, growing it to about 50% of where we were uh, with just carry out and delivery uh, over the first three weeks, I think. Um, that being said, we also did some family meals, um, tried to think outside the box. And originally, when it was still kind of a little lighthearted, I guess, for lack of a better term, we gave out a roll of toilet paper with every uh, to-go order. We just tried to think how to get marketing value out of it. Um, once it got real, for lack of a better term, um, we obviously took a more serious approach to it and started kind of um, trying to figure out what the next step was, which uh, the day they allowed us to open again was the day that I actually started construction on one of my uh, properties. We completely closed it, remodeled it, um, gutted it to make it more uh, open air, uh, outdoor seating, um, we literally made it clean and COVID free for lack of a better term. It has a very different feel, but it's, it's much more friendly to those that don't want to be in an enclosed space. Um, Terrific. So that's, so, that's it in a nutshell. Great. So you, you weren't doing a huge curb and delivery business, but obviously you pivoted to that very quickly. Correct. Great. Now, K Katerina, you had a different story altogether in that you're on iDrive your business is convention driven and Correct. you're on the second floor. Mm -hmm. it takes first side pickup, just a teeny bit more complicated. So tell us what you did. So when, so when we were announced our closure, um, you know, it, it was actually pretty emotional for all of us being open 13 years and, and hearing Disney had closed um, it was a big shock. So we didn't know what the future, you know, was going to hold. So d during this time, we actually um, didn't do any curbside delivery. Again, being on the second floor, we never really did much delivery to begin with. Um, given our location, we're not in a, a neighborhood area. We're in tourist district. And, you know, with the, ho with the hotels closed and such, we decided to... Um, we closed for, for a month and we did renovations. Uh, we updated our, our, our bathrooms, made everything touchless. Um, you know, we just took this time to just spruce up the restaurant um, and, and make it COVID friendly as possible um, during this time. Uh, then at, at one point we had an issue with our employees needing to come back to work. We had left our managers on on our payroll and we were just working on things such as like inventory, updating our inventory program, our recipe books, um, just to keep everybody busy. And then when people were coming to us with unemployment running behind, um, needing jobs, that's when we decided, okay, let's see what we can do with curbside delivery. 
Um, and thankfully for, for the landlords, you know, we were able to open up certain sections where they could just drive through um, in, in the valet area. Um, the guests would call us, you know, we would run down the food. You know, we had looked into um, payment through, through hotspots where the, the guests can run their card um, you know, right, right at the car. Um, we had looked into different delivery services that had less of a fee. Um, you know, with Uber Eats and DoorDash, their fees were, were up there with between 25 and 30%. Um, so we signed up with a company named Chow Now, which was a flat fee. Um, and we brought in, you know, some of our employees, you know, to, to do deliveries um, for us and then to be able to cook the food. Um, so we, we just tried our best, you know, with, with what we had going on. Um, so you waited, not. you waited a little while. So everybody had their different approach to the exactly. interim period. So now here we are, everybody's open or at some stage of opening, I believe outside dining, maybe for, maybe some of you have inside dining as well. So tell, tell the audience a little bit about maybe the top two or three things that you've done to make people feel comfortable and how you've adjusted your restaurant, whether it be you limited your menus using QR codes, how you kept labor costs, um, you know, uh, relatively low compared to having less diners. Uh, let's, let's start with you, Lorene. Okay. So um, what we've done is uh, the, the um, staff, when they open the door for you, they'll open the door when you come in so you don't have to uh, open the door yourself. We have hand sanitizer. We're offering single use menus. Um, if we don't have the single use menus, we can disinfect the existing menus or you can view menus online. Um, elevated the disinfecting surfaces. Uh, using single-use um, condiments, uh, installed a, a credit card chip reader so that um, for uh, quick pay, low contact pay, uh, put in a barrier at the cash register between the guests and the uh, cashier, rearrange the dining rooms to achieve that six feet between tables. Um, the one important thing, though, is we didn't mark off the tables. Uh, we actually removed any excess tables and put them outside or in storage. Our president wanted to maintain the open area, airy, inviting environment. Um, and then we put as much seating outside on the patio as possible uh, to accommodate the lower um, seating arrangements uh, capacities in the restaurants. Right. So you had said that your patios were very integral to this whole transition. That's correct. Great. Michael, what have you, what have you done? A uh, very similar approach, actually. We uh, immediately went to paper, uh, single-use menus. Um, we took out tables um, every other pretty much. Um, obviously, at that point, uh, in the beginning, there was no bar service, so all of our parcels just went away. Um, we put them all in storage. Um, we actually switched out uh, our point of sale payment uh, process, basically, so that there was uh, it made contact us a little easier. We added a barcode to our guest checks, uh, a QR code, sorry, that the guests can scan and pay from their phone, so they don't need to give anybody anything. Mm -hmm. Um, masks, obviously, uh, for the employees, um, sanitization became something of, um, a show, I guess, for lack of a better term. We used to have a big theory. One of my big things was uh, the guests didn't need to see what they don't need to know. Um, it was magic how they how things happened. Um, they just knew that the table was clean and we did a full 180 and said, okay, now I want you standing there like a gunslinger with yeah. a spray bottle in each hand. Um, I want them to know that even if it's not their table that you're cleaning, they're watching you clean the other table next door to them and they can, they can see what we're doing. Um, we went to uh, plastic for, for cups, uh, just made them disposable, um, just because it was easier instead of refilling drinks, obviously. You know, we're a burger place that's kind of a quick turn, but people are thirsty, they're mowing lawns or whatever they're doing. Um, they could drink seven iced teas, so that we never wanted to 
burn that much plastic before, but that became how we had to do it. We give them a new glass every time. Um, trying to think if I missed anything, and I probably missed a bunch, but that's, that's okay. pretty much I'll it. Come, I'll come back to you. So great. So Katerina, the same for you. And uh, let us know. And I think one of the things that you did is you've actually consolidated your menu a bit, correct? Correct. We um, we shrunk down our menu. We took on our most popular items just to help with the efficiency of prep um, so we can save on payroll and just keep everything um, nice and fresh to our standards. Um, so you know, we went back and, and re looked at our menu. Um, we've done the paper menus as well. Um, we we re removed the tables from our dining room in order to have the six foot social distancing. Um, originally when the bar was not allowed to be open, we had removed uh, those chairs as well. You know, the staff wears the PPE. Um, we disinfect the, the tables after each uh, guest. Uh, with a specific solution from Ecolab that we spoke with. Um, and then our cleaning company comes in and does um, a disinfectant nightly as well. Um, just being that we're, you know, again, given our location with the tourism, you know, we, we're trying to take the extra step um, to not have, you know, um, any contamination of some sort. Um, and then thankfully we do have our patio dining and, um, you know, we put more tables out there as well uh, so the guests can come out and, and dine with us. So one of my questions is when you start taking out tables and people are wearing masks, so the restaurant doesn't feel as comfortable. And in the case of Katerina, I mean, Tavrona Opa, people dance on the table. So <laughs> tell me a little bit about how you are recreating a, a nice customer experience in light of all of these physical changes that you've worked so hard to create within your restaurant. Katerina, why don't you start? Because you really have the, uh, the dance yeah. on the table thing going. Um, so I remember the first day when we reopened and I saw our staff wearing the masks and gloves and I was like, I can't believe this is happening to us um, in all honesty. And I think it's just something that somebody gets used to seeing. Um, so for us trying to recreate the atmosphere, you know, our staff used to be very involved in the entertainment. That is something that we had to go back on. Um, you know, we do allow the, you know, that our guests do dance on tables. We do still allow that, but nobody can intermingle with each other. Um, so, you know, the each party can get on the table and have a good time. Um, but we have, we are having to, you know, have that social distancing from the guests. Um, in comparison to before. Um, so, you know, un un unfortunately, you know, we do try to recreate the best that we can. Um, you know, the, the, the special thing about Taverna Opa is when you walk in and see that craziness, um, we're trying to, again, uh, recreate it. And, you know, we do have our belly dancer. Um, we used to have three. Now we do have just the one that comes in. Um, you know, and, and tries to, you know, do a show for the guests. Um, you know, we are, we are throwing the napkins and, and thankfully people love our food. Um, so they'll at least, in, you know, get yeah, to enjoy great. a great dinner with us. That's great. Okay. Uh, Laureen, what about, what about anything special from an ambiance standpoint that you guys have seen or done or feel? No, I don't think so. Um, other than, you know, just trying to make sure that the customer feels uh, safe and comfortable and sees the cleaning going on. And we're still just trying to maintain the, you know, open, eerie, inviting environment in the restaurant. Okay, great. Michael, anything? Uh, other than the fact that we've just, we've kind of gone out of our way to make sure, we have a lot of regular local business that know us and most of them are disappointed that you know that they can't see the smile on the face of their favorite server or whatever it is so we've made a point of kind of going overboard with joking around with them letting them know that it's like we feel like they're home and um you know there's a smile under this mask for you type of thing just being very verbal about it and making sure that we've always been one a kind of place where the customers and the, and the employees banter a bit and we can be a little irreverent at times um and we still try to do that, I guess. And they, they know that our heart's with them. So, but it's okay. very, like Katrina said, it's a different, you know, part of our business, we have an open kitchen. It's a show and it's, it's hard when you can't, 
interact, I guess. So. It's, it's, it's tough on everybody. So now that we're in, in this opening stage, where does your, uh, and I think this will apply to mostly to Michael and Katerina, where does your takeout, so it went from 100% of your business to now that people are able to dine in, what, what's, what's that percentage look like now? Has it kept up? Are people still doing delivery and takeout? Are you still promoting it? What are you doing? Michael, I'll start with you, because I know this is a bigger part of your business. Okay. So it was weird. As soon as the dining rooms opened, my carryout and delivery dropped. And I went, oh, crap. It's because I can't. I can only see it. 16 people. Well, I, one of them. The other one I could do 25, 30. Um, obviously, I increased the outdoor seating, so that helped a little bit. But I really was, was nervous. Um, and I think part of it was just due to the fact that there was more options for people. All of a sudden, everybody was that didn't do a lot of carryout was open for business, and they – um, they had more options. So actually it picked back up again after a week or so we started to see it, um, pick up. And as a matter of fact, last week, uh, instead of being, and again, the times are different, but we actually did more business last week at one of my restaurants than we did last year. Um, and that's all due to the fact that carryout is now 50% wow. of that store. Now the bigger store, um, saw huge increases, but it wasn't, that strong. Although, you know, for a couple nights there, we did actually beat beat last year, which is, I don't know how, and I'm not crossing my fingers and I'm knocking on wood, but um, the carryout is probably going to end up being, we're still pushing it, and I'm, I've am i added ways to make it easier with curbside carryout and different things like that that we've never, we never pushed before because we, quite frankly, didn't need to. Um, but I think we're going to see it level out at about 35, 40% of our business until something dramatic changes and we can squeeze more people in the building. Hopefully it'll be an additional 35 to 40%. Is really that would be we're looking at, right? Fantastic. That's what we're trying that's, to get to. That is the hope. Yeah. Katerina, what about you? Because you had really pivoted to start the delivery. And so now that you're open, has it gone away? Um, it has definitely dropped for us, the, the curbside delivery. Um, we did have a little bit of a spike last week as well, like Michael man mentioned. Um, but it's maybe 10% of our business. It's, um, you know, it's, I don't really see it growing. I think just people, when they think about Tavernova, they think about the experience of coming in and dining with us. So the curbside, as much as we've tried to push it, um, it really hasn't accelerated for us. Um, not at, not at the, the Caverna yeah. Opa location. Yeah. yeah. Lorraine, any, anything you can add to this based on what's going on at, uh, First Watch? Yeah. yeah. So at First Watch, um, pre-COVID, uh, the only way to get a to-go order was to call the restaurant and have a server take the order. Um, during COVID that first week, uh, we stood up an online ordering platform in a matter of days. Um, and now some since we've reopened, um, we're continuing to evolve that program. So now you can order online or by calling the restaurant. Um, and then we have delivery partnerships with Uber Eats and DoorDash. So we have um, seen an increase in to go, which uh, really was insignificant prior to COVID. Uh, and um, we have also modified the menu to add a couple of bundles and the increase in the takeout has also, we've been able to reallocate some of the labor um, as it's provided an opportunity to increase the staff for that service. Yeah. So. And you've had additional challenges as well because you're a breakfast, you know, known for your breakfast and breakfast isn't necessarily the thing people think about in terms of delivery. So you're, you're working on that as well, I think we discussed, correct? That's correct. Yeah, so you're making modifications to your menu for that, okay. Um, I, in a lot of the groups that I'm in, social media, restaurant groups and what have you, whether they're consumer or restaurant uh, owner groups, uh, there's been a lot of mention of customers having two kinds of attitudes. One is a bit of arrogance. I don't know why, because they're expecting things to be exactly as they were before all this happened when they dine in. And the other is that they, they mention um, a feeling of sadness among people 
inside of the restaurants. Like they're feeling so even when even though they're dining in, they're sort of feeling alone and isolated. Have you seen any of that in your restaurants? And if so, are you doing, you know, have you seen any trends and are you able to combat it if you do? Anybody got it? It's okay if you didn't, I'm just asking. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll pitch in, I guess, a little bit. Um, as far as the, uh, the sadness piece, I, ha I haven't seen a lot of that. I think people are more happy to finally be able to go to the, and again, I'm more of a local, you know, burger and a beer place where they've been, he said, you know, I really wanted to come and get away from whatever they wanted to get away from. Um, but uh, on the other note, the, the arrogance piece is amazing to me how prevalent, it, I mean, they're angry. In the beginning of the mask uh, phase, 80% of the complaints that I got about the masks were they did not want us wearing masks. Um, and we have evolved our mask wearing process. We're now back to wearing it's it, It's not worth everyone's safety, I guess, to, to, to let's make have it a mask a, discussion. A, let's, let's, let's put two minutes on the mask discussion. Is anybody else seeing, does everybody, Laureen, Michael, and Katerina, does your staff wear masks? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes, ours too. Okay, great. So in that, are you seeing any of this and are you training your people to deal with some of this pushback in, that people are getting with masks? So I think I haven't really heard about the pushback as much as I think it's uncomfortable and it's hot, um, hard to talk or hard for other people to hear when they're talking. Um, I think for the most part, our team has been uh, re-energized and happy to be back. No, I meant from the customer standpoint. You, anything there? Yeah. Okay. Michael, you're... Uh, yeah, we've had multiple um, kind of discussions. As a matter of fact, today I had another discussion with our staff and kind of let the leads um, know where my, you know, my stance was and, and how to combat some of that. And, and it's, again, more because it's, you know, we'll get a lot of local, 80% of our business pre-COVID was all local. I mean, people that are here year round that are the same, some people come in five days a week. They, again, I'm going to use the expression, we're in the wild west here. They, it might be a little different than other parts of the country, but um, the wild west of Florida. Uh, I, I think people get it. I think that, you know, that if a customer is going to be angry that we're wearing a mask, I, I, I don't know what to tell them. I, I don't think there is a good answer to that. Um, I can see them being mad because we aren't wearing them, I guess. Um, and we certainly have our moments where we have trouble, you know, with that as well, with the staff not doing what they're, they should be doing, you know, so it's, and wearing it properly is another thing altogether. So. Katerina, have you seen any of this in your um, restaurant? Um, I, what I can say is the, when we first opened up the diners that did come out were the ones that weren't scared. So they were like, oh, it's silly to wear a mask. Oh, it's not necessary. But on our part and our staff, you know, everybody still wore the mask. Um, none of the staff members really complained about it. Um, they were pretty good, but you know, it was just the beginning part. It's interesting to see how those, um, that did come out right away to dine, there were just the ones that weren't scared of something happening to them. As now that time goes on, I can tell even from the phone calls that we're getting recently, it's, you know, everybody's asking, what are your precautions? What are you doing now with COVID-19? Are you wearing masks? Are you, you know, social distancing? What about groups? Um, so the, the in, I, we've had an increase in phone calls of what we are doing uh, where before we didn't have that. Right, so that brings us kind of to the next question, which is, um, this circumstance has required new policies. And obviously, First Watch, you're a, a larger company, but even on a smaller company basis, you, you, how your staff interacts, your PPE, your sanitization. But what about a policy in the event someone gets, <laughs> someone gets it inside of your restaurant? Because one shot and, you know, it's, it, could be, it could be damaging. Do you guys have a policy? We do. We have a policy. Um, every employee, when they come in, they go to the point of sale system and there's a couple of questions to ask if they're uh, experiencing any symptoms or they know anybody with any symptoms. 
If the answers are no, then they can move on to have their temperature checked. If their temperature is below 100.4, then they can go ahead and clock in. Um, if the answer is yes, then they need to speak with the manager or if the temperature is over 100.4, they speak with the manager and they're sent home. It's recorded in a wellness log. Um, the management team communicates to the rest of the restaurant team so that there's transparency for what's going, you know, what's going on and why that person was turned away. Um, uh, if there is a staff member, um, then we deep clean the restaurant and then also look at the wellness logs and see who they've been in contact with and determine if there's any additional uh, employees that may be or customers that may be at risk. Okay, so knowing that it depending on where you are different communities that this is going to be a roller coaster that there's going to be more concern some weeks than others. Are you any of you actively promoting your businesses and your sanitization and your safety as part of that. Michael, you want to start with you? As you probably know, Angel, I actively promote everything because yeah. <laughs> uh, what I am. Um, we, a lot like you know, the answer to the first question, we do it. We have the very similar policy and procedures. We have the questions that we ask in the morning, they take the temperature check, we have a log. Um, in the event that anybody does come down with it, we're a really small staff. As a matter of fact, I have, you know, I can think of one staff member that three of them all live in the same apartment. Um, basically, what would happen if, 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 God forbid, it doesn't happen, but if it did, they wouldn't be on the schedule and they would need to get tested before they're allowed to come back because of the close proximity. Um, and it could be very detrimental because I don't have a giant. I mean, we have 42 people that work for us. So if four of them, were sick because of they all lived in the same environment, um, that'd be 10% of my staff. So that would be tough. As far as the promotion bit, um, yeah, we're actively on social media at least, making sure everybody's seeing what we're doing. Um, you know, letting people know that we, we're clean and we're, we clean every day and we have a cleaning company. I love the image in. of the gunslinger. Yeah. <laughs> um, we have a, you know, not every night like Katrina's, but, um, we have a cleaning company that comes in and deep cleans once a week at each location. Then we also do our regular cleaning and sanitization every night. So, um, you know, the, the goal is for people to know that, I guess. And that's, yeah. that's that. Katerina, are you, are you actively promoting the restaurant and or the sanitization? Uh, yeah, we are uh, promoting it because we do know it's important for everyone coming in. Um, when we first announced that we were reopening, we did, um, an e-blast to all of our, our, our guests and, you know, uh, wrote down exactly what we're doing in sanitation and, and how we're taking care of the employees and uh, for them not to come in if they have the uh, fever of 100.4 or more. Um, the other thing is we do have it actually posted on our website as well. I do know here in Orlando, it's one of the things that Visit Orlando is pushing, um, making sure that all the restaurants and um, any entertainment that a guest were to go to that sanitation is top priority. Um, so we're doing the best we can, you know, in terms of that. Now, if somebody comes along and um, it, unfortunately might be infected, you know, that's something that's out of our control. Um, but, you know, in terms of sanitation, we are on top of it. We have to take it a day at a time. Lorene, yeah. are, 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 is First Watch promoting? Um, so I, I would say more communicating, and I think uh, that's what Michael and Katerina were saying as well, um, is communicating through social media what it is what we're doing in the restaurant from a safety measure. Um, and also, at, we did the same thing where we reached out to our um, loyalty customers and asked what is it that they would like to see in the restaurant and use that feedback with a lot of the decisions that we're making yeah, as yeah. well. Great idea. So here we are whatever date, it's, we're almost in July. And um, I want to just congratulate the three of you because you are here under the worst of circumstances. You're all still here and moving forward and I'm sure are going to meet with success, but your industry is obviously taking some very hard hits. I'm sure some of your competition is closed down. I'm sure you're seeing it everywhere you go. Tell me what you think in, a, in an industry that works on small margins and 
is so dependent on customer loyalty, what you think you're going to have to do as restaurant owners over the next 12, 18, 24 months to continue to sustain and be profitable. Laureen? Yeah, so I think um, the consumer, uh, they're going to definitely be more discerning about where they spend their dining dollars. So we have to continue to listen to the customer. What is it that they want? Um, we need to continue to provide consistency and value um, because the consumer is going to, you know, have the choice of, you know, our restaurant over another. And um, we're going to have to continue evolving best practices in our business and monitor uh, this you know, fluid situation. Thank you. Michael. Uh, yeah, I think reaching out, uh, talking to our customer, I mean, any way that we can communicate to our existing customer base and get them to be rabid fans rather than uh, guests or customers, I think is going to be important. Um, leveraging technology analytics. I mean, we're, we've switched one point of sale system over when we did our remodel to a kind of more robust program that we can uh, gather information quicker, faster. Um, we're going to have to do that at our other location as well. And, you know, we're looking to expand our footprint. Um, but in doing that, it, it changes how you have to look at it. And I think the outdoor dining piece is, is going to be huge. Um, for the foreseeable future. And with Florida, it's hot. How do we make it feel uh, comfy, cozy, and when it's 92 degrees out? Um, I think that's going to be huge. And we're, you know, we're actively working on that right now at one of our locations. The other one, I can't, not much I can do. Um, the one of them, we're adding misters and we're you know, adding sail shades and we're, you know, putting games outside for the kids so they can play in the grass and just trying to find different ways to make it uh, an experience, I guess. And, but I think that more importantly, you're reaching out to the people on an ongoing basis and keeping them in the loop as far as what we're doing, what promotions we're doing, what, what we're doing for them, what they're doing for us. And I think that's it pretty much. Katerina. Um, for us, I mean, of course, like everyone mentioned, and, you know, making sure we keep that guest loyalty. Um, again, given our location of being um, with the convention center and the hotels, you know, I was telling my husband, I feel like we're back to year one of being open, um, heading out back to hotels, letting them know, know that we're open. Um, you know, they're slow, but at least during those peak weekends when they do get those guests in to be to say, hey, remember us, you know, um, to have those guests come over to us, um, just reevaluating our marketing, um, looking at, you know, digital marketing again, um, and then just, you know, making everyone feel comfortable when they come in, you know, and then in, in terms of, of looking at our small margins, you know, you go back and you start to reevaluate your credit card process or your internet, uh, your food costs, your purveyors, you know, there's a whole series It kind of, it's almost like a financial reset. You just start looking at your numbers again and say, okay, can we cut here? Should we cut there? Um, without, you know, hurting the integrity of the brand. I love that. That's, that's a great place to end because one of the things we talk to everyone about is what did you, what, what should, what should you have been doing differently anyway before this? And it kind of forced you into making some changes. So I'll ask one more question and then we'll go to Q and A. What's the one thing you wish you'd done differently at the beginning of this? And by this, I mean, quarantine, pandemic, any, uh, whether it's a hurricane, you know, whatever, Whatever the world can throw us, what's the one thing you'd wish um, you had done differently? Laureen. So I wish that we had the uh, online ordering platform uh, up and running before this hit uh, so that we would have been able to stay open, um, you know, during the past six plus weeks and uh, to keep the, you know, more uh, people gainfully employed. I think there's a lot of people who would agree with you that that would be something they would do as well. Michael? Yeah, similar answer. We, you know, in the very first week when we went to carry on delivery only, we basically furloughed almost everyone. Um, and I wish I would have been more aggressive. I, we were pretty aggressive, to be honest, but I wish I would have been more so um, because I don't think I would have had to lay anybody off. I think, you know, I went out and licensed my concession trailer as a food truck 
and we put it out locally uh, as a third location, basically, you know, closer to people's homes. If I would have done that prior to this, if it would, I should have done it a long time ago. I knew it was, I knew it was what I should have done. I just didn't do it. I should have done what Katrina talked about. I should have been going through and reevaluating my insurance contracts and everything on an ongoing basis. And instead, you get complacent and you just say, "Oh, I've done business with them for years. They're taking care of me." And then you realize, "Oh, well, maybe I could have saved ten grand," you know, but. Now I know. Now you know. Katerina, I know we've heard from you already, but maybe there's one other thing you would have liked to have uh, done. I actually, what Michael just mentioned about having that food truck, I remember telling my husband, I'm like, I wish that was something that we had done. We have had always spoken about it and never did it, you know, because you get busy. And I'm like, it would have been a perfect opportunity to help generate, you know, the jobs and income that we were lacking during that time. Fantastic. Well, you we can come all... check out mine anytime you want. Yeah. I'm only two hours good. away. So come down and show you all about it. Perfect. Yeah. I'll learn so much. Uh, thank you guys so much for this. Um, I think you've really given us tremendous uh, information. So, Kristen, do we have any questions? Yes, we have a couple. Uh, Raven asked uh, for First Watch. You mentioned that the employees had to uh, answer a couple questions before clocking in. Was that done through your POS system? And if so, what POS, what POS system are you using? Uh, so I do understand it is through our POS system and I have texted a friend for the answer because I, uh, I am uh, in lease administration and facilities and I just call it the point of sale system. Um, so as soon as I have an answer, I will uh, report back to you. Very good. And a question from Joanne. For the team, what marketing or promotions have you used during this time that has worked well for you? I guess so, I can pitch in on that. Um, one of the things that we, we are, our name is Brew Burgers. So a big part of our business is local craft beer and things like that. Um, when this first happened and we were closed our dining rooms, I went, uh, I have 16 taps at one location and 14 at another and no way to sell beer. So we immediately purchased disposable growlers uh, and did dirt cheap pricing and put, did that as part of the promotion. Hey, you know, come and grab a, a great local IPA with your burger. And I literally was only charging 12 to $15 um, for 54 ounces of, of local beer. But um, it worked great, and we actually we went through about 150 growlers within the first week, I think. So it was um, it was impressive. So that was one thing. Cool. So during the um, COVID, during our closures, we shared recipes from our cookbook, so you could make your favorite first watch meal at home. And then when we reopened, we uh, offered free coffee the first week. Great, thanks. Okay, all right. So if anybody has any questions, please feel free to type those in and we will ask them of our panelists. I'll ask one of, of Laureen while we're waiting. I'm like, what is the number one best-selling first watch dish? Oh, boy. Okay, so again, you're asking me a question. This, <laughs> okay. what's, your fav what's your favorite first watch dish? How's that? Sure. My favorite is a lemon ricotta pancakes. Mm. So it, it's almost like eating a dessert for breakfast. So the pancake, the meringue, and uh, confectioner's sugar and strawberries is delicious. I'm a little hungry over here. I just want you to know that I'm thinking about a burger. I'm thinking about your Greek food. I'm thinking about the pancakes. <laughs> I'm pretty sure First Watch has a great, is it avocado smash or something? I forget what it's called. Whatever it is, that is delicious. Yep. Whatever you do is magic. Thank you. Um, Angie and uh, Angel, one of the things that we didn't talk about was um, advice. Uh, if we wanted to leave it a last piece of advice with um, our guests. Sure. Um, so I wanted to say thank you to Kristen and the Bricksmore team for uh, putting this uh, together today, but also for being a great partner during all of this. And the one piece of advice is I would definitely suggest um, if you have a landlord that you do work with your landlord on what opportunities there are for uh, outdoor seating. 
with the diminished capacities in the uh, restaurants, um, not, not everybody has a patio. So is there an opportunity to do something on the sidewalk or is there something to do in the parking lot, put up a tent, add tables and chairs, um, ask the landlord to you know, push your social media or whatever your promotion is. So, or add uh, takeaway spaces, anything like that. So uh, just that would be my piece of advice is um, you know, talk to other retailers and, and talk to your landlord and, and um, because we're all in uncharted territory. And so I think you really um, need to reach out during this time. Thank you, Laureen. Anybody else have a last bit of advice? for anybody who's running, feeling tired right now and. <laughs> I, as I I have something to say. Somehow Angel was like, hey, he's gonna say something. <laughs> uh, one of the things that we had talked about Angel before is, you know, I guess the piece of advice is it's, this is not a time to tuck your tail between your legs. This is the time to go and, and get some market share. Don't, you know, don't survive, thrive, I guess, for lack of a better term. Um, it, go beyond it. and we're you know we're actually looking and actually working with with our landlord too to find is there other spots that maybe my concept would work that some other concept might not work there are places that are going to go out of business and it's unfortunate but if if we don't take this opportunity as as service providers to better our operations and look for avenues for expansion then we grow stagnant and and die on the vine i guess too so i guess that would be my piece of advice don't survive thrive you know go out go after it and and do something. I mean, we started a ghost kitchen. I, I never would have found a million years that I would have been selling chicken nuggets out of the kitchen <laughs> under a different name. But you know what? It drives incremental revenue. It doesn't cost me a bit of, well, other than paying the delivery service fees, there's no added expense. So why wouldn't you? You know, so. Great, great advice. Katerina, as you sit in your car. <laughs> Um, I, I agree, you know, with, with Michael, um, you know, you just can't sit back and, you know, and be like, why is, why is this happening? Or, you know, you just have to fight through and, you know, it's, it's a great way to just, you know, you start to, to think again, you start to become creative again of different ways to try to bring in your guests and, and think about expanding your brand and, um, you know, the fortunate but unfortunate part with every challenge, you know, with every challenge, there is something that new that, that comes along. And, um, you know, that's what we're looking forward to. We haven't, you know, we, we've actually are in the process of opening up a restaurant soon, you know, we're in the middle of construction, um, right in the middle of all, all this craziness happening. And, you know, we're staying positive and, you know, we know that things will get better at some point and, um, you know, and we're, ex we're ready and excited. Great, great note to end on. Um, Kristen, do we have any other questions? Nope, that's it. I just want to address Lorene's question. If you are a Bricksmore tenant on the phone um, and you are interested in outdoor dining space, please reach out to your property manager who you can find on the tenants page of our website. I also want to let you know that today's recording um, will be posted on the COVID resource page of Bricksmore's website where you can find additional funding and business resources. And with that, I just want to thank our panelists, our moderator, and for those who are watching today. Thank you so much for joining us.